The National Convention was a single chamber assembly in France from the 20th of September 1792 to the 26th of October 1795 during the French Revolution. It succeeded the Legislative Assembly and founded the First Republic after the insurrection of the 10th of August 1792. The Legislative Assembly decreed the provisional suspension of King Louis XVI and the convocation of a national convention which was to draw up a constitution. At the same time, it was decided that deputies to that convention should be elected by all Frenchmen 25 years old or more domiciled for a year and living by the product of their labor. The National Convention was therefore the first French assembly elected by universal male suffrage, without distinctions of class. Elections The election took place from 2 to 6 September 1792 after the election of the electoral colleges by primary assemblies on 26 August. Owing to the abstention of aristocrats and anti-republicans and the fear of victimization, the voter turnout in the departments was low 11.9% of the electorate, compared to 10.2% in the 1791 elections, in spite of the fact that, that the number of eligible to vote had doubled. Therefore, universal suffrage had very little impact. On the whole, the electorate returned the same sort of men that the active citizens had chosen in 1791. In the whole of France, only 11 primary assemblies wished for the retention of the monarchy. Of the electoral assemblies, all tacitly voted for a republic though only Paris used the word. Among chosen deputies none had stood for election as a royalist. Though only a million voters went to the polls, there is no good reason to doubt that they represented the will of the five million Frenchmen. The convention held its first sessions in a hall of the Tuileries Palace, then it sat in the Salle du Manega, and finally from 10 May 1793 in that of the Salle des Machines, an immense hall in which the deputies were but loosely scattered. This last hall had the galleries for the public, who often influenced the debate by interruptions or by applause. The members of the convention came from all classes of society, but the most numerous were lawyers. Seventy-five members had sat in the National Constituent Assembly, 183 in the Legislative Assembly. The full number of deputies was 749, not counting 33 from the French colonies, of whom only some arrived in Paris in time. Besides these, however, the newly formed départements annexed to France from 1792 to 1795 were allowed to send deputations. According to its own ruling, the convention elected its president every fortnight. He was eligible for re-election after the lapse of a fortnight. Ordinarily the sessions were held in the morning, but evening sessions also occurred frequently, often extending late into the night. Sometimes in exceptional circumstances the convention declared itself in permanent session and sat for several days without interruption. For both legislative and administrative the convention used committees, with powers more or less widely extended and regulated by successive laws. The most famous of these committees included the Committee of Public Safety and the Committee of General Security. The convention held legislative and executive powers during the first years of the French First Republic and had three distinct periods, Girondine, Montagnard or Jacobine, and Thermidorian. Girondine Convention The abolition of the royalty is a matter you cannot put off till tomorrow. Call it dare boys. The first session was held on 20 September 1792. The following day, amidst profound silence, the proposition was put to the assembly, that royalty be abolished in France, and was carried with cheers. On the 22nd came the news of the Battle of Valmy. On the same day it was decreed that, in future, the acts of the assembly shall be dated first year of the French Republic. Three days later the corollary was added, to guard against federalism, that, the French Republic is one and indivisible. A republic had been proclaimed, but it remained to enact a republican government. The country was little more republican in feeling or practice than it had been before at any time since the Rennes. 
but now had to become a republic because it no longer had a king. When the convention met the military situation was undergoing an extraordinary transformation that seemed to confirm the Girondine prophecies of easy victory. After Valmy the Prussians withdrew to the frontier, and in November French troops occupied the left bank of the Rhine. The Austrians, who had besieged Lille in October, were defeated by Dumouriez at the Battle of Jemaps on 6 November and evacuated the Austrian Netherlands. Nice was occupied and Savoy proclaimed its union with France. These successes made it safe to quarrel at home. Girondins and Montagnards Girondine had been a geographical expression, and Jacar been the name of a club. Now a group of deputies from the Gironde gave their name to a party, and a non-party club began to identify itself with the political opinions of a group of Paris representatives. The Jacobin leaders were men little different from their opponents in origin and upbringing. They believed, as the Durandans did, in the war, the Republic, and the Convention. They were no less idealistic, and no more humanitarian. But they had a greater regard for the interests of the common people. They had less respect for political shibboleths. And they had an extra capacity for realistic, and if necessary ruthless experimentation. Three questions dominated the first months of the convention. Revolutionary violence, the trial of the king, and Parisian dominance of politics. Antagonism between Paris and the provinces created friction that served as a propaganda and combat weapon. The resistance of the departments to centralization was symbolized by the desire to reduce the capital of the revolution to its 183rd share of influence. Much of the Gironde wished to remove the assembly from a city dominated by agitators and flatterers of the people. It did not at the time encourage an aggressive federalism that would have run counter to its political ambitions. The trial of the King Louis must die so that the nation may live. Maximilian Robespierre from the opening of the convention the Girondins showed no inclination to bring the king to trial. They were more interested in discrediting Paris and its deputies. Their decision to hound the Jacobins was not merely a choice of priorities. They genuinely wanted to spare the king. But in reality the convention had to declare him guilty if it wanted to avoid damning the 10th of August 1792, its own existence, and the proclamation of the Republic. If the king is not guilty, then those who have dethroned him are, as Robes Peer remarked on 2 December. Once the convention recognized Louis's guilt it could hardly refuse to pronounce the death penalty against a person who had summoned the aid of foreign powers and whom the sans culottes considered responsible for the ambush at the Tuileries. The discovery of the iron chest in the Tuileries the 20th of November 1792 made the trial inevitable. Documents found in this secret chest proved without any doubt the treachery of Louis XVI. The trial began on 10 December. The Montagnards put the debate on the ideological level. Louis XVI was classified as an enemy, alien to the body of the nation and as usurper. Balloting began on 14 January 1793. Each deputy explained his vote at the rostrum. The vote against the king was unanimous. There was to be no popular referendum as Girondins hoped. The fatal vote started on 16 January, and continued until the next day. Of the 721 deputies present, 387 declared themselves for the death penalty, while 334 were opposed. 26 deputies voted for death on condition that he was reprieved. On 18 January the question of reprieve was put to a vote. 380 votes were cast against 310 for each time the Girondins had split. On the morning of 21 January the convention ordered the entire National Guard to line both sides of the route to the scaffold. Louis was beheaded at the Place de la Revolution. With few exceptions, the French people accepted the deed in silence, but it made a profound impression. Execution of the king aroused pity and exalted royalist convictions. Yet it seems undeniable that monarchical sentiment was dealt a severe blow. A king had been put to death like any ordinary man, royalty lost. 
never to recover, the supernatural quality that even the revolution had not yet eradicated. Within the nation, voters and appellants swore undying hatred of each other abroad. The rest of Europe decreed a war of extermination against regicides. The crisis and fall of the Gironde the assembly began harmoniously enough, but within a few days the Girondins launched a bitter attack on their Montagnard opponents. Conflict continued without interruption until the expulsion of the Girondin leaders from the convention on 2 June 1793. The Girondins could at first rely on the votes of a majority of the deputies, many of whom were alarmed as well as scandalized by the September massacres, but their insistence on monopolizing all positions of authority and their attacks on the Montagnard leaders soon irritated men who regarded party as faction. One by one able deputies such as Coven, Cambone, Carnot, Linda Tambera began to gravitate towards the Montagnards, while the majority, the plain, as it was called, held itself aloof from both sides. Girondins were convinced that their opponents aspired to a bloody dictatorship, while the Montagnards believed that Girondins were ready for any compromise with conservatives, and even royalists that would guarantee their remaining at power. The bitter enmity soon reduced the convention to a state of vociferous paralysis. Debate after debate degenerated into verbal brawl from which no decision emerged. The political deadlock, which had repercussions all over France, eventually drove men to accept dangerous allies, a royalist in the case of Girondins, sans culottes in that of the Montagnards. Thus the struggle within the convention continued without results. The decision was to come from outside. Ever since the king's trial, the sans culottes had been constantly assailing their appealers, and quickly came to desire their expulsion from the convention. If this were achieved, the government could recover the energy to enable it to deal with the aristocratic plot by arresting suspects and establishing a revolutionary tribunal, military setbacks from the first coalition, Damourias's treason and the war in the Vendée, which began in March 1793, were all used as arguments by Montagnards and sans culottes to portray Girondins as soft and demand exceptional measures which Girondins were reluctant to adopt. The Girondins were forced to accept the creation of the Committee of Public Safety and Revolutionary Tribunal. Social and economic difficulties exacerbated the tensions. The final showdown was precipitated by Jean-Paul Marat's trial and the arrest of sectional activists. On 25 May the Paris Commune demanded that arrested patriots be released. In reply, Isnard, who was presiding over the convention, launched into a bitter diatribe against Paris which was infuriatingly reminiscent of the Brunswick Manifesto. If any attack made on the persons of the representatives of the nation, then I declare to you in the name of the whole country that Paris would be destroyed. On the next day the Jacobins declared themselves in a state of insurrection. On 28 May the Cité section called the other sections to a meeting in order to organize the insurrection. On 29 May the delegates representing 33 of the sections formed an insurrectionary committee of nine members. On 2 June, 80,000 armed sans culottes surrounded the convention. After an attempt of deputies to leave collided with guns, the deputies resigned themselves to declare the arrest of 29 leading Girondins. In this way the Gironde ceased to be a political force. It had declared war without knowing how to conduct it. It had denounced the king but had shrunk from condemning him. It had contributed to the worsening of the economic crisis but had swept aside all the claims made by the popular movement.